Super Mario in real life. Let me take you back in time. Season 3 of Friendship is Magic is currently airing on the Still Afloat Hub Network. MLP fans are patiently waiting for an announcement of Season 4, when out of the blue, Hasbro makes a shocking announcement. Pony and Real Debuting in 2013, Equestria Girls is exactly what it says on the tin. Was a pony, now it's a human. There you go. I'm not gonna go look up interviews with the marketing team at Hasbro because it's pretty obvious the reason they made this is just to rip off Monster High. And Ever After High, but you know. Mattel had a doll that was purple, they needed a doll that was purple. So, what does Hasbro come up with? Yo, put that bag back on! Yeah, these look really ugly. They don't even try to capture the style of the ponies. The eyes kind of do, but when you step back and look at the whole face, they all look gross. The outfits too look really poorly designed. Like, what even is this? Quality of the toys aside, you can't have a new My Little Pony thing without a cartoon, right? In 2013, Friendship is Magic was like the biggest thing in the world. Little girls, adult men, and whoever else couldn't get enough of the show. So, to push these little cretins out, Hasbro gave us Equestria Girls in 2013. A lot of time has passed since then, but I can only guess that this was controversial when it came out. Like, would this even work? Would it be good like the show? Or would it be another one of those CGI straight-to-DVD doll movies? Which I actually hear are pretty good. People now seem to like it somewhat. I mean, they made like a zillion other movies at this point, so I think they've just gotten numb to it. But I want to go back and watch the first one, just to see. Does it really serve as a good start to a franchise? And does it hold up today compared to everything we've seen from G4? My thoughts regarding the EQG series have kind of been meh since I got back into MLP last summer. The only thing I really associated it with was weird DeviantArt stuff, but when I finished Season 3, I told myself I just had to watch the first one, you know, for nostalgia. So I did, and the only two things I seem to remember from it were 1. The great and powerful Trixie needs some peanut butter crackers, and 2. Get up, get down, if you're gonna come around, we can work together helping to- Looking at it now, as someone who's older, I can kinda see some of the stuff that works, but more stuff that just really doesn't. That's a theme in Equestria Girls. There'll be something that's kinda neat, but then it's thrown off by something completely bad. For example, the character designs. For the most part, they did a good job of translating the art style of the pony world into the human characters, with the same size eyes and general face shape. Some people complain about the legs being too long, and yeah, I can see that, but I'll talk about that when I bring up the animation. For each individual character themselves, they sort of miss the ball more than they hit it. Most of the characters we recognize either have designs that don't represent their pony counterparts, or ones that look awkward. There's no real binary scale or ratio of these two things, it's more of a scatter plot with an X and Y axis. The best out of the main six, I think, is Rarity, because all you need to do for her outfit is put her in whatever people in 2013 consider stylish. Twilight looks appealing, but her design is kind of vague. You could remove the colors and cutie mark and tell somebody who's never seen EQG that this was Applejack, they'd probably believe you. Applejack herself, Pinkie Pie, and Rainbow Dash all have sort of the same problem, where their designs look more like a cosplay rather than something you would wear to a high school. And can somebody tell me why they decided that Fluttershy's design would be the one to show the most skin? Don't shy people not like being seen? Sunset Shimmer's human form was built from the ground up for this, and yeah, I can tell. She looks really nice. Celestia and Luna look awful, and I didn't even know this was clearly until I looked it up on the wiki. Zips and Snails look great, though. These guys look exactly how I'd imagine them as humans. Also, white Big Mac. Another thing that bugs me about the designs is that the characters in EQG suffer from major same face slash body type syndrome. I think they would have benefited from giving some of them a different nose, or maybe making one or two of them smaller, just so that they aren't 100% the same character model. But all those things I complained about obviously come from a need to make the designs toyetic. And I get that, after all, the point of MLP for a long time was, and still is, to sell toys to little girls. Speaking of aiming EQG towards little girls, the story. Equestria Girls 1 feels more like an OVA than an actual theatrical endeavor. You know, the ones where you just have a minor threat show up, deal with them in time for the next mainline adventure, and never speak of them again. That aforementioned threat is our new villain, Sunset Shimmer. An ex-student of Princess Celestia, Sunset is bent on using Twilight's crown for her own evil plan. How do Twilight and the gang find out about this mysterious new foe, you may ask? Celestia just tells them. 
Yeah, the setup for the movie is kind of rushed. They barely give us any time to get to know the main six. Each of them get about two lines max to explain their personality. I don't even think Fluttershy got any, actually. Then they set up a mystery with this new unicorn, only to give us all the exposition we need about her a minute later. Once we leave Equestria, we get to the human world where the story actually begins. The rest of the movie essentially feels like a decom, mixed with one of those cartoon character in the real world movies. In terms of stories set in high school, it's pretty basic. I know that if you're making a high school movie after the year 2004, there's obviously going to be some similarities to Mean Girls, but wow, is it suspiciously similar here. With all the themes of social sabotage and the over-dramatization of high school. Okay, real talk, for anybody who's watching this and hasn't been to high school, I just want to tell you right now, it's not like this. Yeah, there are bullies and friend groups with different interests, but it's not like Heather's or The Breakfast Club or any of those. So, going back to the movie, Twilight's mission, once she figures out what's going on, is to get her crown back by becoming Queen of the Fall Formal. You see, Principal Celestia found the crown in the courtyard and thought, yeah, let's use this for the big dance. So now it's up to Twilight to win back the crown the only way she knows how. And I'll give you a guess, it's one of the words in the show's title. The concept of an interdimensional conflict being solved via a vote at a high school dance sounds dumb, and yes it is. They don't even play it for laughs, either. It's 100% serious. If Twilight isn't the prom queen or whatever, Equestria will literally cease to exist. It's stupid, but the cheesiness of it gives me this sort of ironic enjoyment. If Equestria Girls 1 had come out around seasons 5 to 9, I guarantee you they'd constantly be winking and nudging to the camera about how dumb the concept is. In place of that, there's a lot of fish out of water stuff with Twilight, at least in the first half. Walking on two legs and getting used to a human body, I get. What I wondered though is if Twilight has ever been to a school. There's so much stuff in Equestria that's modeled after our world, and I doubt that a public high school would be any different. Maybe she just went to a private unicorn school? I don't know. I think at least she would know how things like a yearbook or a trophy case would work. And even a school dance, like they have one in Season 9. Sunset is an okay villain. Having a character who's basically Twilight's equivalent to Shadow the Hedgehog is a cool concept. In fact, it's so cool they use it twice. Again, her evil plot does feel kinda lame, just doing Mean Girls prank shenanigans. Oh, and when she wrecks the school dance, they set up that Twilight gets the blame put on her by Sunset, then her name gets cleared in the next scene. So what was the point of that? Sunset wrecking the fall formal already has a payoff, in that by bringing the school together the main six are able to get it up and running again. So why did they have to introduce a non-problem like that? But that's a minor thing, it's one scene. Overall, Twilight does have an interesting arc here. After becoming unsure of herself, wow, that never happens, and her status as a princess, she's suddenly forced into a new situation where she has to use what she's learned about friendship to get out of it. If she can survive the Disney Channel version of high school life, she can survive anything. Now, I can't think of a segue into the next thing I want to talk about, so I'm just going to do what Animat does and put up a little title card for it. The Animation. For ponies, the puppet rigs they use sort of work in their favor. In Friendship is Magic, they actually move like horses more than they do in other iterations, like My Little Pony Tales or in G3. When the same style and animation team is translated into these really lanky designs, it sort of gets messy. There are a lot of angles where the characters look off, and sometimes they move in super weird ways, like the main six's terrifying run cycle. The one part where the animation shines the most, though, is the cafeteria song. You can tell this is where they tried the most. Some bits look really fluid, and overall, there are a lot of fun moments. Tunerific Tariq, who you should go watch right now, brings up this thing called musicality in a lot of his videos, and yeah, this is a scene where the characters are literally dancing, but it's still there. Not to a meticulous degree, but as I said, this is the scene where they put the most thought into the movie. Like, for example, that the magic of friendship, one, two, three, four. But why would they put the most thought into this one scene in particular? Because the song is the one that they also use in the commercials. Ah, uh, Hasbro, you cheeky little multi-billion dollar corporation. So we know they tried to make that song as catchy as possible. And it works! It's by far my favorite from this one. For the other songs, they sort of do the Disney's Tarzan thing where you'll have a montage and then you'll just have Phil Collins singing over it. But instead of Phil Collins, it's the main six. They all range from okay to forgettable. They all have this generic pop sound that's the equivalent to Friendship is Magic's mandolin. A close second favorite is This Is Our Big Night, it just screams early 2010s, and you know how I feel about that. A Strange New World is nice, but it does the thing where I can only think of the Friendship is Witchcraft version, the one where they fix the dance is kind of forgettable, and the remix they do of the Friendship is Magic theme is just kind of okay. It's like one of those fan remixes that doesn't really let the original song breathe and just puts random syllables in places, so it sounds like something out of Friday Night Funkin'. 
overall, I think Equestria Girls doesn't hold up all that much, but it's the first in the series. Compared to what I've seen from the later ones, this feels like they were just trying to find their footing. The animation, music, and story really do make this feel like their first attempt to do this with MLP. It reminds me of the way the first Friday the 13th is nobody's favorite. It's all about Jason Lives. Or in this case, Rainbow Rocks, which I'll be talking about next week. So, Equestria Girls was never meant to be a franchise. It was supposed to be a one-and-done deal until Hasbro saw the potential of doing a sequel. The first one had a relatively open and shut story, but it wasn't like you couldn't do another one. So, what did Hasbro decide on? Okay, hear me out. Rock and rule, but with horses. Equestria Girls 2 Rainbow Rocks was released in 2014 and is the most memorable out of the main series to some fans. Is it just because of the soundtrack? Maybe. I don't know. These guys are kind of cool too. Is Rainbow Rocks really all that better than the original Equestria Girls? Does Rainbow indeed rock? Well, let's take a look together and find out. The story starts right as the first movie ends, with the big magic fight between Sunset and the main six. A group of sirens called the Dazzlings see that somebody brought Equestrian magic into the human world and head to Canterlot High. You see, their plan is to feed off the Main Six's negative energy and get enough power to take over the world, but the Main Six immediately know something's up and try to stop whatever they're doing. With the power of music. Since the Sirens feed off people's negative emotions, the Main Six enlists the help of Equestrian Twilight to help them perform a counterspell against the Dazzlings at the upcoming Battle of the Bands. To be fair, the story setup is really driven by a lot of contrivances and coincidences, like how there just happened to be a music showcase when the Dazzlings show up, or how Sunset is able to reach out to Twilight through this one magic book, but that stuff doesn't really matter when you look at the big picture. Like, wow dude, you pointed out plot inconsistencies in a movie called Rainbow Rocks where a bunch of My Little Pony characters sing in a band. Good for you. What really matters is that they get to do a fun Battle of the Band story, and not so much why they get to do a fun Battle of the Band story. When I talked about the first one, I mentioned how I really like the silly premise of a magical conflict being solved through a cheesy high school stock plot. Same case with this one, but they crank it up to 11. It's sort of fun to just sit back and watch these characters go through a situation the show writers would never think to put them in. In order to have the typical band isn't getting a long conflict, most of the main six's respective quirks get in the way of the band being able to perform. Pinkie Pie and Rarity are kind of the same, Applejack is the voice of reason, and Fluttershy is shy. Twilight has the exact same character arc that they give her every 5 minutes, with her being unsure if she can do the thing, and then doing the thing at the end. With the magic of friendship, trademark. And what is Rainbow Dash's deal even? Yeah, in the show she can be cocky and arrogant, but here she's just obnoxious. Unless there's some hidden traumatic backstory on why she thinks she's the best at music, I doubt she would act like this. Even after her friends told her to tone it down, Sunset is sort of... there. According to the all-knowing EQG wiki, she wasn't even a main character in the earlier drafts. That honestly makes a lot of sense, considering most scenes with her are just her hanging out with the main six and being reminded that she was the villain in the last one. She has a nice little arc though, where she redeems herself in the end by saving the main six. For our antagonists, we have the Dazzlings. These guys are just the best. Their gigantic hair and bizarro Hannah Montana wardrobe makes their designs really appealing. On top of that, they have a fun dynamic. Adagio is by far my favorite. The other two have normal, benign teenager personalities, but she has this cartoonishly evil demeanor about her that makes her super fun. She's like if the guy from Wishmaster got transported into a high school, Red Jewel and all. Arya is extremely underrated. In terms of Tsundere characters in cartoons, I'm surprised she's not one of the more popular ones. Also, I love pigtails as a character design thing. She really rocks those. I know everybody likes Sonata, but she's kind of my least favorite. Her and Pinkie Pie are written in the same way, where it feels like the writers forgot to put jokes in the first draft of the script, so in place of those, they do the MCU thing where they stop the scene dead in its track so that something dumb can happen, and it's usually with those two. Trixie also shows up as a minor antagonist, which I like. This was before Season 6 when they sort of redid her character. Spike did not need to be here. I know you have to have Spike because it's a My Little Pony thing, but he, he does nothing. Except for the very end, but... Uh, you know, they could have just done that without Spike. Another point against the writers is how Principal Celestia and Luna are handled this time around. They really didn't put any thought to them and just said, okay, let's get them out of the story as quickly as possible. I'll let my friend Crispy explain his problems with it. Thank you, Shunk of Corn! Hi, I'm a cameo appearance. Shunks was ever so kind to offer smelly old me a cameo. So, here we go. 
Here's something I feel like isn't brought up nearly as much as it fucking should be. The dialogue is total fucking wank. So basically, after the Dazzlings do their weird cult thing in the cafeteria, the girls go to the principal's office to report their suspicions, and what does Principal Cunt Lestia say? Oh, they were nice, by the fact I've known him for one day, you know, first impressions. <laughs> Whoops. And then Luna opens her wrinkly old flaps and says, Oh, maybe Sunset's trying to shine the spotlight off of herself. Are you blind, you cum stain on my trousers? Sunset's trying to get the spotlight on her to show that she's changed. What are you smoking, and can I have 27 grams of it? When the humanized cum jar begins chattering, the principal ends up saying, Oh, well, mate, aren't you counting the battle too, mate? Also, yes, I'm very aware they were under their spell, but the writing just seems so unnaturally brutal. Even for my little equine, companionship is wondrous. That's the biggest gripe I have with this film, the writing. Now listen, I wasn't expecting fucking citizen cake, but I was expecting something a little more interesting than Scientology the musical for girls. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to look up Sunset Shimmer on Derpy Buru for totally not weird, fully academic purposes. In fact, a bit more academic than Cantalot High. Thanks, Crispy. By the way, you should totally subscribe to him after you're done watching this video. Yeah, they did improve on the writing, but not by that much. The animation, though, is an entirely different story. For the animation, I think they knew what they were doing a lot more with this one. The characters don't look weird or off-model as much as they do in the original, and when they do, it's usually for a joke. They do some nice expressions a lot of the time, like Rainbow Dash's dumb smile she does in the practice scene, or this part during Shake Your Tails where Twilight just looks at the camera, I, I think that's really funny. Perspective shots are another thing they improve on. In the first one, where Twilight spins around here, it looks kinda janky, but when they do it with the Dazzlings, it actually looks like the face is attached to the character's head. All the songs in the movie are diegetic, meaning that they happen in-universe, but the sequences are never boring. They throw in some abstract visuals into a lot of them, and in the ones where that doesn't happen, there's usually something interesting going on in the scene. Like in Shake Your Tails or Welcome to the Show. Speaking of Welcome to the Show, oh man, the climax. They save the best for last. The animation looks stellar and it's insane all around. Like look at this, what even is this thing? They turn the movie into a rock opera for like 5 minutes here and it's easily the best part. Speaking of the best part, the soundtrack for Rainbow Rocks is way better than Equestria Girls 1. The Cafeteria song I think is better than like some of the songs here, but in general the soundtrack is an improvement. As I write this, Under Our Spell is currently stuck in my head, Battle of the Bands is great too, and so is Welcome to the Show. Every song they give the Dazzlings all have this R&B sound to them that makes them really stand out from the others. Aside from the Dazzling songs, the title theme is really nice too. Better Than Ever is super catchy, Awesome As I Wanna Be is nice, Shake Your Tails is okay, Shine Like Rainbows has to be my least favorite, it just sounds like a ripoff of the Livin' Maddie theme song if anybody remembers that show, but at least they're all memorable. The music does a great job of carrying the movie. That's probably one of the reasons everybody remembers it more fondly than they do the first one. So, that's the movie. But wait, if we're gonna talk about the movie, we also need to talk about the shorts that were released alongside it. These all came out on YouTube and are pretty okay. Let's watch the first one. Featuring everybody's favorite, DJ Poe 3. All this one is is just her walking down the street and listening to some sick tunes. Pretty forgettable. The other ones can be sorted into three categories. 1. Main six member shows off their instrument. These are pretty self-explanatory. In case you didn't know that Rainbow Dash plays the guitar, or that Pinkie Pie plays the drums, here you go. Some of these do introduce more human versions of the Friendship is Magic characters. I don't really care about the human diamond dogs, but human Flim and Flam are wrong on so many levels. The old timey music man thing worked in Equestria, since that world isn't based on any specific time frame, but in the 21st century, they just feel off. Also, the eyes are way too big. 2. Soundtrack Fodder These are music videos with the main six. There's one with an unedited version of Shake Your Tails, and one where they go to an amusement park. Rarity gets her own song, where she subjects some innocent background characters to whatever this is. Nothing special, but if you wanted a visual for some of these songs, these are pretty good. 3. Deleted Scenes These might also be soundtrack fodder, but I don't know. The fact that they have sunset in them makes me feel like they were supposed to be part of the movie. Friendship Through the Ages, I don't know where you'd put that one, but... My Past Is Not Today definitely feels like a deleted scene from the third act. The shorts are okay, but nothing beats the real movie. In fact, just like the shorts, the full movie is available to view on YouTube. 
and it's not some crappy low quality upload either, it's from the official Hasbro channel. So, is Rainbow Rocks all that better than the original? Maybe, I don't know. I feel like they were having a lot more fun with this one, and it stands out more as its own thing. Seeing the main six use the power of rock and roll to defeat an enemy threat is the exact amount of cheese I'm here for. Rainbow Rocks has fun villains, great music, and really does a good job of setting up a franchise. There are flaws, like some of the characterization and the movie being criminally unfunny at points, but in the end, it's just a fun movie. That's all it's trying to be. I'd say give this one a watch if you like the idea of Equestria Girls, but don't want to sit through the first movie. So, Equestria Girls 1 and 2 I have fond memories of, from when I have my MLP phase back in 2014. Every Equestria Girls thing from then on is sort of uncharted territory. I've heard mixed things about friendship games, some say it's good, but others say it's boring and a waste of time compared to Rainbow Rocks. Well, honestly, I think friendship games is about on par with Rainbow Rocks in terms of enjoyment. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, I'd hardly say it's boring. Yeah, the music might not be as iconic, and maybe I didn't have a crush on any of the villains, but it's still fun. Let's take a look at it, and I'll tell you why. Now, for the story, since they've already done the big dance, the battle of the bands, what other stock plot can EG pick for the third one? Ah uh, yes, the underdog sports team. Friendship Games has our old ragtag group from Canterlot High facing off against the uppity Crystal Prep, who beats them at everything. This year's event is the Friendship Games, a sort of three-part competition with an academic decathlon, a relay, and whatever this is. Despite being called the Friendship Games, they're far from friendly. After losing to Crystal Prep for like literally forever, Canterlot High is not taking any shit. Yet again, another stock premise, but one thing I very much do appreciate about the story is how quickly they get into the actual games. A lesser movie would have the characters sitting around for the first hour, but they don't waste the viewer's time here. The games happen at a good point in the story once all the character conflicts are set up, around halfway through. In order to not give Canterlot an unfair advantage, Luna literally just tells Sunset, hey, you know that magic thing? Yeah, yeah, keep that shit under wraps, bro. Like, magic is so normalized at this point at Canterlot that the most anyone's concerned about is the school cheating at a game. Oh, and everybody also knows that Sunset is a pony now? The writers really don't care anymore, do they? But you know what? I like that. It makes the series a lot more fun, and makes it feel on par with something like Monster High or the more recent DCOMs, like Zombies or Descendants. It's the case where supernatural stuff is the norm, and nobody has to worry about keeping it a secret or anything like that. I mean, look, if stuff like this kept happening at your school, I'm pretty sure you would get numb to it eventually. The rival school, Crystal Prep, isn't all that special. It's just your standard rich kids in fancy uniforms. They do introduce Twilight though, not Pony Twilight, Human Twilight. Psy Twy, as she's called. Her whole deal is that she wants to know more about the magic that's been coming from Canterlot High and accidentally ends up absorbing most of the main sixes in this weird little clamshell thing. The conflict in this movie, even if it is pretty cliche, sort of feels more grand than Rainbow Rocks. The last one was about using magic, but a big part of this movie is people trying to understand and get a better grasp on it. So world building? Kinda fresh. Kinda fresh. Going back to the conflict, for our movie's villain, we have Crystal Prep's evil principal, Abacus Finch. Like, Atticus Finch. From To Kill a Mockingbird? No, I don't get why they called her that either. Principal Cringe's number one character trait is being obsessed with her reputation, which she never shuts up about. In her first scene alone, she says the word reputation like 80 times. Her whole scheme is to blackmail Twilight into competing in the games by holding her back from this one independent study program she wants to do. That plan makes sense if we're talking about the academic part, but an athletic competition? You want this girl out of everyone in your school to compete? She can't even shoot an arrow, but you know, you do you I guess. Also, if you're gonna have the rival school be the Crystal Empire, why not have Sombra as the evil principal? You have shining armor and a disgusting looking cadence, so why not complete the whole set? Now, alongside Saichuai, we also have the Shadow Bolts, who compete against Canterlot in the games. These guys are all pretty one note, like, the one who's just Rainbow Dash, the one who likes music, the one who talks like Ben Shapiro. Out of all of them, I think Sour Sweet has to be my favorite, and Sugarcoat is nice too, they give her a few funny moments. 
In general, they don't give them that much screen time, but that might be more of a blessing than a curse. I like that they'll use them for when they're needed, instead of having them kill the flow in a scene to talk about funny XD tacos. The villains as a whole actually aren't really as big of a part of this movie as they were in Rainbow Rocks. It's more about the games themselves and the conflict between the main six and Psy Twy. Psy Twy herself may be technically the same person as regular Twilight, but that doesn't mean she's the same character. Here, she's more like how Twilight was at the beginning of Friendship is Magic, where she's more focused on her studies and making friends. It's refreshing to see a Twilight who's like this, who actually has room to learn and grow instead of doing the same thing over and over again. I usually bring up the music at the end, but sometimes they'll give Psy Twy this little synth theme, which I haven't heard in any MLP thing ever. It's jarring, but I like it. At least it's something different. The main six though, yeah, those guys are all the same. It's kind of a problem I have with the series as a whole so far, but the main six feel really flanderized at a lot of points. In the first and second one, it was really bad, but here they thankfully tone it down. Yeah, there are a few scenes where they pony up that feel out of place, like Rarity's bit with all the uniforms, but at least they have a good reason for that. Also, Pinkie Pie is still kind of annoying, but then again, they toned it down a lot more in this one. It actually feels believable this time when she does something wall random. Unlike in Rainbow Rocks, where it was integral to the story that Celestia and Luna stay out of this thing, the story actually calls for them being there since they need to watch over the games, which is nice so that the conflict doesn't really feel forced, where in the last one they just didn't know what to do with them. Spike is also here. Instead of being a dragon, he's just now a regular dog that got sapped with magic. Dragon Spike is fine, but I just think Dog Spike is neat. Sunset Shimmer's arc finally feels complete in this one. I won't name any names, but compared to some other characters from MLP, Sunset's redemption is way more fleshed out and believable. The main six we're giving her is one part of it, yeah, but in the last two movies, Sunset has actively worked to show she's a better person, even standing up for new friends on multiple occasions. Compare that to you-know-who, who's just like, uh, I'm a good guy now, and the main six are like, oh, okay, like nothing ever happened. Sunset really earns the title of hero after turning Psy Twy to the good side. This time, Twilight is the bad guy, and Sunset has to use the magic of friendship to help her. You know, it's like poetry, they rhyme. Also, I like how it's the good guy doing the you're not so different you and I thing. It's really refreshing and kind of a nice subversion. Overall, I like how they turned Sunset from a really lame villain to a really likable protagonist in the span of like three movies. In my opinion, it's probably the best redemption arc in all of MLP. The character animation in Friendship Games isn't Disney quality, but it looks like they're getting better at animating humans. The worst bits of animation in this movie are nothing compared to all the uncanny stuff from the first one. The look of Crystal Prep 2 is really interesting, with it literally having crystals on the outside. Not only is that cool, I think the visuals are overall more creative in Friendship Games. Like Rainbow Rocks, the climax is where the movie shines. The second part of the games and the ending in front of the school are a lot of fun. All the portals popping in and out with this big plant thing during the motocross race, that's super creative. And wow, they really had a field day with the ending. Twilight getting sucked into that big evil magic ball, all the portals appearing in front of the school, the ground breaking, the transformations. I don't like the stupid Harry Potter fight they do, that was kinda lame. But still, they went all out, and the effects they use for the magic sequences, those are pretty sweet. They don't just reuse the style from the show, they go for something completely different, and it works in the movie's favor. These look like real effects you'd see in an old movie or something, like how they look drawn on top of the frame. It gives them a real nice charm. The intro and CHS Rally are two great examples. Fitting, seeing how those are the two best songs in the movie. Speaking of the music, I appreciate how they tried to go for a different style for this movie's soundtrack. It sounds more sporty. Well, duh, it's a movie about sports. There's a lot more emphasis on percussion, brass, and a fair bit of chanting. They definitely feel more unique than some of the weaker ones from Rainbow Rocks, even if there aren't that many. They manage to use the songs to move the story along a lot more, like Akadeka or Unleash the Magic. My favorite, though, has to be the title theme. It does a great job setting up the whole vibe of the movie and is pretty catchy. CHS Rally is nice too, the different style they use shines in that one in particular. Akadeka is okay, I like the whole montage idea, but the vocals I think are kind of off. Unleash the Magic is a super generic villain song. I think if they cut out the second verse, it wouldn't have made any difference in the story. It goes on for way too long and feels like they're reiterating the same point. Twilight's song has to be the worst. I'm not even gonna look up the name, because it's an uninteresting I Want song that doesn't do anything we haven't seen in any Disney movie. Overall, Rainbow Rocks was more consistent in quality, but there are a few bangers in this one. I think that's the theme with this movie.
Rainbow Rocks was a lot of fun, but I feel like Friendship Games is honestly kind of better. In certain areas, in certain areas. They had a fun premise, some great songs, a nice wrap-up to Sunset's Redemption arc, and some creative visuals. The villains sucked and will never hold the same place in my heart that the Dazzlings do, but that's not important. What is important is setting up for more adventures, and merchandise. We have our main seven all ready to go, including Spike, so the franchise is set for any future movies. No Equestrian Twilight required. But what will they do for the next one? They've done the Big Dance, the Battle of the Bands, the Rival School. Oh, I know. Sleepaway Camp. Here we are, Legend of Everfree. From what I've seen, the Equestria Girls series gets better as they go along. So why would Legend of Everfree be any different? Well, you saw the title of the video, didn't you? Out of the main four Equestria Girls movies, Legend of Everfree has to be my least favorite. Granted, Rainbow Rocks and Friendship Games sort of really raised my expectations, but Everfree is so underwhelming. There are things I like about it, but the bad really outweighs the good. It's not even bad. It's, as I said right before, really, really underwhelming compared to the others. It feels so shallow. Well, let's take a look at it and see why it's not as good as I was expecting it to be. So, our story has our old Canterlot High Gang going on a week-long trip to Camp Everfree. It's your standard movie summer camp with a bunch of random activities for characters to do in the background, and a mysterious local legend. Once the main seven arrive, they discover fabulous secret powers that are the result of these magical geodes. Twilight can levitate things, Pinkie Pie can create these magical glitter bombs, Applejack has super strength, Rainbow Dash can go fast, Sunset can read minds, Rarity can make crystals appear out of nowhere, Johnny is the human torch, and the thing just loves to fight. The main six end up eventually using these new powers against the camp's owner, Gloriosa, after she takes the geodes for herself. The overall story feels less like a proper movie and more like an episode of a TV show or a special. The general flow of it is very Adventure of the Week. There really isn't all that much going on aside from the main conflict, and what there is, it's more like a B-plot in the sitcom. There's very little breathing room in the story. The whole thing is, main seven go to camp, main seven get powers, main seven do action battle, movie over. The magic at the camp comes out of nowhere, meaning it isn't connected to anything else from the previous movies. In the last three, they were very clear about how this was the only instance of equestrian magic the world has seen. And it worked! It felt like an actual overarching story, and not a series of random specials. In this one, they just happen to be there while magic shenanigans are going down. The movie's also really short, only being like 70 minutes. The Arthur Iceberg is longer than this movie. So, remember how I said the main six got less flanderized as the series went on? I only meant like some of them. Well, all their personalities in this one are pretty down pat. Even Pinkie Pie, who I think I realize I just don't like. Rarity, though. I don't think the writers get that there's any nuance to her character. The only personality trait they give her in this one is she likes fashion. Like George Lucas writing C-3PO. Oh, he's always afraid. Oh, she only likes fashion. In any scene where Rarity is the main focus, that's probably the only thing she'll be talking about most of the time. They even give her this little subplot about doing this camp fashion show. Like, I know that's what she loves, I know she loves fashion, but you think she'd want to break from it eventually, especially if she's going to be spending the whole week in the woods. I don't know, maybe they wrote her like that, just because they didn't want to do the whole, oh, this character is grossed out by nature, she doesn't want to get the mud on her, etc, etc, cliche with her, but I think that would work just fine. Rarity wanting to have fun with her friends, but being afraid of getting her clothes or whatever dirty feels more reasonable than having her do the same thing she does when she's at school and at home. And wherever else for that matter, on the bus? I don't know. Since Sunset Shimmer's redemption arc is over now, she's sort of the best character out of everyone here. Not even kidding. She's like one of those Mary Sue characters who's the best at everything, but actually done right. Her attitude towards everything that goes on is really chill and down to earth, and she usually knows what's best to do for every situation. The reason I think this works here is that she doesn't start out like this. Originally, she was one of the worst parts of Equestria Girls 1, but we've slowly seen her grow and change, and she sort of deserves to be a Mary Sue. She can have a little Mary Sue. As a treat. For Twilight, thankfully, they haven't exhausted every possible character arc for Sidewai. On the surface, it's Twilight being insecure, yeah, big deal, but she has an interesting reason for it. 
After turning into Midnight Sparkle at the Friendship Games, she has this thing where she's worried about accidentally hurting her new friends, which is something interesting for Twilight to go through. I really don't think they did that with her in the show at all. It's sort of like what Sunset went through in Rainbow Rocks and Friendship Games, but to a bigger degree. They even do that dumb thing where people will bring up how they defeated her in the last one, and then look at her and be like, oh, sorry, lol, because, you know, that was the funniest part of Rainbow Rocks, next to Taco Tuesday. In this movie, they try to give Twilight a love interest, which I'm honestly surprised they haven't tried in any of the other movies. I could've sworn they gave her like a boyfriend or some sort of crush or something. Uh, whatever. This guy's okay, he's definitely my favorite of the two counselor characters. The banter that he and Sajwai have sounds really forced and dumb, but at least it's there, and they have something to bond over. They actually have some chemistry, which is great! Imagine if they tried giving Twilight a love interest who had like no chemistry with her and just acted awkward for like three movies, that would be awful. Okay, so if you don't get the joke, the, the joke is uh, I'm, I'm talking about Flash Sentry, but I'm really not. The other counselor, Gloriosa, she's kind of meh. Unlike most villains from the series who are evil for evil's sake, she actually has a legitimate motivation. A motivation that makes her interesting. You see, Filthy Rich wants to close the camp down and build a spa on top of it, but she's not having any of that. Yeah, pretty basic situation, but they mix in the whole equestrian magic corrupts thing with her. Gloriosa tries to use the magical geodes to make the camp more fun, but accidentally gets consumed by the power and turns into one of those equestrian demon things. I'm gonna be upfront with you, I'm not a fan of this design, or Gloriosa's design in general. She's kinda uggo. Her and her brother look really generic, like they could be just some other character from CHS. They also try this Scooby-Doo thing with them, where Sunset thinks they're trying to scare people away from the camp by making it look like this one ghost story is real. And that goes nowhere. Also, how they explain Gloriosa's plan is super lazy. Sunset touches her arm and then instantly knows everything about it. I know that's her power, but they could have done it in a better way. At least it's better than her standing there and being like, oh yeah, that's what was going on. But, I don't know. I think the villains in this movie have the same problem as the ones in Friendship Games. Oh, Spike is here too. He gets to wear a cool hat. And that's really it. Character animation in Everfree is the best it's ever been. The rigs they'll use for the characters have more poses for the eyes and mouth, which let them do a lot more expressions. The characters are rarely static in this one. You don't have any of those awkward shots where a scene will be happening and the rest of the characters are just standing there in their default pose. They'll usually have them leaning a certain direction, or even, gasp, moving like real people instead of Chuck E. Cheese animatronics. I like how they try for a different location for this one. The idea is that it's supposed to be a breath of fresh air compared to Canterlot High, and the setting legitimately looks beautiful in some parts, like some of the shots in the intro or in the Midnight in Me sequence. I mean, if you like forests, you'll love this movie. I think too much of the movie takes place on this dock, though. CHS's hallways might all look the same, but that's what schools look like. I swear, this dock has more screen time than Spike. Also, a minor nitpick, but why do they sleep in these weird tent things instead of cabins? Like, the interior looks exactly like a cabin, but you go on the outside and it's this? Whatever, whatever, I said, it's a dumb nitpick. The visuals for the ending are cool, but that's all they really are. Like, they tried to top Friendship Games by having an epic ending, but it doesn't work for me. The build-up for it isn't really there. Since I mentioned before, our villains and heroes meet-up is sort of incidental. It doesn't have the hype that Friendship Games does. It's less like an epic conclusion, and more like a kid who really likes Power Rangers mashing their Equestria Girls dolls together to make them fight. The actual ending for the movie is pretty okay. It does what the last two have done and sets up more stuff for future adventures, like the Main Six's pony power necklaces and Sidewind Timber's relationship. I'm not a fan of these. The Main Six having pony powers is good enough. I don't see why you have to make them super action-oriented and specific like this. Like the weird Marvel-esque climax, it feels sort of tacked on without any thought. One thing I never thought I'd be saying about this movie is how varied the music is. No, not the actual vocal songs themselves, so they are all pretty different. They actually go for a lot of different styles for the background music. Sometimes they'll do the standard MLP light orchestral stuff, but other times they'll go for more synth music like in Satwai's Evil Freddy Dreams that she has about Midnight Sparkle. There's a lot more guitar in the score, which adds some nice atmosphere. Also, I dig that little slow dance song they play for when they have the big dance at the end. For this one scene with Gloriosa's demon form, they actually try to do some sort of Danny Elfman thing. It's not all that bad, it's pretty good. For the actual songs, they're eh. 
Out of the main four movies, I'm sad to say that the ones in here are probably the least memorable. There aren't that many, and the ones that are there are really short. Like, I'm not sure if any of them actually reach 3 minutes in length. They all have a generic country pop sound. The fake Philip Phillips song they play in the opening credits is pretty catchy, probably my favorite. Midnight Me is nice, it's better than Sidewise song from Friendship Games. Embrace the Magic sounds way too similar to the magic of Friendship Grows, but it's still good. The Rain Booms get an okay song at the end, if you wanted another one of those. The ending song, Hope Shines Eternal, sure is there. And I know it's a controversial opinion, but Stand Forever Free isn't my cup of tea. Yeah, it's because I don't like Gloriosa and the whole climax, but I don't know, it sounds sort of lame. I do like the lyrics Stand Forever Free, and how it sort of sounds like Stand Forever Free. If that's their intent, that was pretty clever. Sort of like We Say Jump You Say How High from Under Our Spell. It's a nice little, little double entendre, like they're telling you to like jump off a bridge or like off a building or something. But you're like, oh, how high? Because you're like at a concert because you're listening to their music. And that's what you do at concerts. You jump up and down to the music. Anyway, for the final movie in the main line of Quest Girl series, this one was kind of underwhelming. It might have been because my hopes were too high, but it really feels like a major downgrade. They definitely perfected the animation and writing most of the main seven, but it just overall wasn't as engaging. The villain was lame, and the visuals weren't all that interesting. Friendship Games really feels like the grand finale to a trilogy, and this one feels more like a pilot to a TV show. Well, that's the end of my retrospective. Yeah, I said I would review every movie, not every special in short. Honestly, I don't like reviewing things, I think it makes me sound really pretentious, especially after writing this one and looking back at the script. But, you never know. Maybe I'll return to the Equestria Girl series eventually, if they ever try to bring it back for G5. Or maybe during the holidays, because didn't they do a Christmas one? Oh, there's also one where they bring the Dazzles back? Sick. I'll look into those on my own time, and leave you with my ranking of the first four. At number four is Everfree. It really didn't have anything going for it other than some cool animation. Then part one. This one has a big nostalgia factor, and works as more of a special for MLP than a standalone Equestria Girls movie. After that, coming in at a very close second is Rainbow Rocks. It's iconic and does everything that the first movie does, but better. It has the best villains and soundtrack. Best of the four is Friendship Games. The writing is such an improvement over 1 and 2, and feels like a culmination of the whole series. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave it a like and drop a comment down below. Your support means the world to me. If you want to see more videos, hit that subscribe button and click on the little bell icon so that you get notified whenever I put out a new one. The next video I'm working on won't be coming out for another two weeks, but that's because we're going to take a look at an all new My Little Pony Iceberg, which I'm super excited to share with you all. I can't think of a better outro, so until next time, goodbye.